everyone, Becoming Bishan was a project that was conceptualized by a group of Raffles Institution students in the second year of junior college when Mrs. Cheryl Yap of the archives, Raffles Archives and Museum told us of funding opportunity from the S350 celebrations by the government. We thought about what kind of project we could do and eventually we thought that we could do something about the communities near us of Bishan and of the Columbarium beside us Kong Wai Siu, Pek San Teng. We then started doing interviews of the villagers from the village in Bishan in the past, of their descendants and of the members of the clan association. Eventually, using the material we collated as well as the artifacts that we managed to collect, we built an exhibition out of it. Today, the exhibition is housed in the Kong Wai Siu, Pek San Teng Heritage Gallery and today, we're going to show you the exhibition. This is the first panel of our exhibition about the origins of Bishan. Our exhibition goes from the origins of Bishan all the way to the war and then to what Bishan is today. Bishan was a village that started in the 1870s and it comprised of immigrants from mainly Guangdong, China, as well as persons of other ethnic groups. In the past, because welfare from the British was minimal, immigrants from China had to form their own welfare groups and this happened in the form of clan associations. Hence, there was the Federation of Clan Associations called the Kong Wai Siu Pek San Teng, which comprised of 16 clans from Guangdong, China. The emphasized the concept of Shen Zhong Shui Yuan, which was very important because ancestry helped them to remember their homeland and therefore they also managed a cemetery. Uh, much of Bishan was a village as well as a vast piece of land which was a cemetery. Eventually as there were more burial plots, what happened was that they had to organize the burial plots into pavilions uh, to serve as markers for the families to find their dead relatives. Then the cemetery expanded and they also included other dialect groups other than those from Guangdong, China. And interestingly, the cemetery was a hotbed for gangster activity, so there were a lot of fights that went on in the cemetery. What an interesting backdrop that you will make for secret society films. Moving on to the next panel, there are a number of festivals for the dead that you would be aware of, such as Qingming Festival and Hungry Ghost Festival, where we remember the dead and where also we try to organize Ge Thai performances to serve the ghosts around us. Uh, but there were also more festivals that went on in the cemetery. For example, there was the Double Ninth Festival, which was to celebrate the triumph of Huang Xing a legendary hero over an evil monster. This is celebrated on the ninth day of the ninth lunar month. There was also something called the Grand Universal Salvation Ritual. This was important because people couldn't build ancestral homes in Malaya, so they had to find ways to remember their ancestors which died in other lands. And so they had this ritual to celebrate the wandering ghosts in other lands. Moving on to the third panel. There are notable contributors to the cemetery, two of whom you will be very well acquainted with. One of them was Hu Ake Wampo, uh, whom the Wampa area is named after. He actually contributed monies to building the cemetery and he also negotiated a land tax exemption for the cemetery. So he made a great contribution. And the next one is Wong Ah Fook. Um, he contributed to founding the Kong Wai Shu Hospital and also gave monies to the cemetery. His body, uh, along with his families, were also in the cemetery itself. Uh, he reserved a large plot of land in the fifth pavilion. For our project, we went to visit the descendant of Wong Ah Fook, his great granddaughter, Datin Patricia Lim, who told us of his philanthropic endeavors. Then, besides philanthropists, there were also notable people buried in the cemetery. So there was a man named Chao Yachi, who was a carpenter 
carrying out an intelligence operation for the British. He was on board the same ship as Raffles and he discovered that there were no Dutch who were present uh, in Singapore, controlling Singapore, and therefore the British were able to enter Singapore. Uh, in that sense, he had a hand in the founding of modern Singapore. Then also there's the story of the seven heroes. Uh, because gang fights were common and also there were fights which were meant to take over territories uh, from other groups, the seven heroes protected the Cantonese community and in the process they lost their lives. Now the seven heroes are still being remembered by the Kong Wai Siu Pek San Ting and sometimes there are rituals to celebrate them. Pek San Ting Cemetery also had a kampong named Kampong San Ting. The, the kampong had bloomed by the early 1900s and reached its peak in 1970, where it was home to around a thousand villagers. So the, the lives of the villagers were intricately connected with the affairs of the cemetery. To some villagers, this was cause for fear, uh, but to other villagers, this proximity meant that the kampong was especially lively during the festivals like Qingming Festival, where lots of people from Singapore would come uh, to pay their respects to the dead. So I'd like to share two quotes here from uh, an ex-villager. So in, in the first quote, he's reflecting on playing in Kampong Santing as a child. So I quote, Our house was completely surrounded by graves. You can say that the cemetery was our playground. Sometimes when we accidentally broke the string of our kites and had to chase after them, we would fall into open graves. We did not see them, so we would just unknowingly run there and fall in as if it were an action movie. Sometimes we would discover catfish in the graves. I have even caught a few myself. At that time, we even sold the catfish for money. And in the second quote, he also reflects on going to the school inside the kampong as a child. Uh, so I quote, next to the temple, a, a shop selling religious goods was used as a classroom. In front of the idols were tables and chairs for lessons. After class, we would play ball games or catching in a shop, and we are literally like bulls in a china shop. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to draw attention to this uh, hand-drawn map, which is based on a former resident's recollections. Uh, so if you look at the map here, uh, this, this is the road that leads into Kampong Santing, and this is Brother Road and Thompson Road. And uh, you can also see that the, the entrance is lined with many small shops um, and, and then of course there was the school here um, Pek San Ting's Chinese school and then there was also the Gong Wai Siu Pek San Ting office next to the school and also a Tua Pek Gong temple here uh, so one important landmark I, I want to point out is the Pek San Ting tea house the Pi Shan Cha Ting uh, so this, this was a gathering place for family members to come and you know, have dim sum, have some tea uh, before they would go together to, to the grace to, to do the home sweeping. Uh, and then there was also a, a Nam Kok cinema here. So this was an open air cinema that was especially popular as a place of entertainment in the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, another interesting thing about this kampong is its multicultural nature. So although the cemetery was set up by Cantonese and Hakka clan associations, uh, actually in, in the kampong, you know, there were also Hokkien's, Teochew's, Malays and Indians mixing together. Yeah, so although we know that the Cantonese villagers initially they clashed with Hokkien's from the nearby Sun Hock village, especially over rural rights, uh, the, the situation soon improved. And especially also with the establishment of the Big Sun Ting Chinese School, where children of different races and uh, dialect groups, they, they came to study together. And Mandarin was used as the common language where, where they learned like, all their subjects. In. Yeah, so I, I just want to point out two interesting Indian residents. So one of them, he was named Pritam Singh, and he could actually speak seven languages, which included many Chinese dialects. Um, and the second one is an Indian girl, you can see her here. So she actually, she was a student at Big Sun Ting Chinese School and she really wanted a Chinese name. So she went to a principal and asked the principal to give her a Chinese name. So he chose um, the name Bi Li. So Bi comes from Bi Shan Ting, Big Sun Ting. Uh, 
uh, this bi which means jade, and li just means beauty. So bi li means jade beauty. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to share two more quotes uh, or anecdotes about what the culture of living in a kampong was like. So the first one was from Miss Lima, an ex-villager. So I quote, we come back at 11 or 12 at night. We still come back without fear because I am from this kampong. No doubt you don't know them, they know you more or less. They don't do any harm. Once stranger comes in, everybody will know it. So if you remember this cemetery was known to others as the Chicago of Singapore, was known as a place where secret societies would come, armed with barangs and guns. But to the villagers, they, they were not scared of it at all because this, this was their home. Um, and a second quote here, also from an ex-villager, uh, it, it reflects about how they, they, the villagers would look out for each other, no matter whether they were rich or poor. So in the 1970s, there was a gang leader named Liang Zhu. Once anyone had problems, they would approach him for assistance. At that time, he used his own money to buy an electric generator for the entire village and wired the electricity so that every house would be able to receive it. He would charge $3 per long fluorescent tube, but he wouldn't force anyone to have a fluorescent tube. To help you better imagine what lies of the people in the cemetery and kampong were like, our team also created some dioramas uh, based on some historical photographs as well as our own historical imagination. So this may not be entirely, completely historically accurate. Uh, so the first scene that I have here is a scene of tomb sweeping uh, at the cemetery. So this, this would be common during the Qingming festival uh, where you know, people, descendants would come to pay respects and also help to clean up their, their, their ancestors' graves and also uh, bring some offerings with them. Yeah, so as, as you can see, there were winding roads in Big Sun Ting Cemetery. Uh, yeah, and this was an especially lively time for the cemetery. So moving on to the next scene here. Uh, so this would be Kampong San Ting, and many villagers actually lived in very simple, humble, uh, thatched roof huts like you see here. And many of them were also rearing pigs, chickens, and ducks, and then they would sell them at the wet market. Okay, moving on to the next scene over here. So this is the iconic tea house, the Pi Shan Cha Ting. Uh, and many villagers re remembered this place fondly, as well as visitors to the cemetery, because this was where they would have dim sum, and where they would gather with their family before going to uh, pay their respects at the graves. And finally, over here, we have the Big Sun Ting Chinese School. This was set up in 1936. Um, and many ex-villagers also fondly recalled uh, attending this school, uh, you know, having sports activities here. So this, this school was actually set up because the founders wanted to uh, provide education for, for the poor especially. While many of us are familiar with the battle for Bukit Tima, there was a similarly crucial battle at Big Sun Ting for control of the nearby McRitchie Reservoir. The Battle for Brattle Road began on the 13th of February, 1943, between the British 18th Division and the Japanese Imperial Guards Division. The British had established defensive positions north of Brattle Road, amongst the tombstones of Big Sun Ting. The Japanese Imperial Guards launched probing attacks that gradually wore down the British defenders. Surrounded, Short on supplies and suffering heavy casualties, the Cambridgeshire Regiment's A Company continued to mount a valiant defence of Hill 90, adjacent to the Aikou rubber factory. By the morning of the 15th, however, the British were in danger of being outflanked and with Japanese tanks massing for a final attack. At 3.30pm, a general ceasefire was announced and by 8 p.m. on the 15th of February, 1943, General Arthur Percival had surrendered Singapore to the Japanese. Singapore was now Sionanto, a Japanese colony. Till today, if you wander into the depths of McRitchie, you can still find remnants of Sionan Jinja, a shrine that the Japanese built to commemorate their conquest of Singapore 
and the many men that they lost in that battle. While many of the residents of Kampong Santing had their houses destroyed in Japanese bombing raids during the battle for Singapore, they experienced further deprivation during the Japanese occupation, suffering inevitable supply shortages and subsisting on a basic diet of sweet potatoes. Despite these challenges, the community came together to help one another and even gave some of their meager food supplies to Australian POWs nearby. In an ironic twist, the resting place for the dead became a refuge for the living. As the Japanese left Pick Something alone due to their fears of disturbing the dead, many Singaporeans fled to Kampong Santing to escape Japanese atrocities such as the Sukching Massacre. So, you know, upon negotiation of the government, uh, the Pek Santing Association managed to reserve about three hectares of land in the new town to be developed into a columbarium to inter the remains of the ancestors that were previously buried within the cemetery. Um, of course, uh, as Yi Ting you know, previously mentioned, uh, apart from the, the, the cemetery, there was also a living active you know, uh, kampong in the same area with villages uh, that also had to be relocated. Relocation of the villages started in the late 1970s and continued all the way until 1986, where the last villager was relocated to the housing estates nearby. Um, you know, moving from a kampong setting to a uh, HDB estate, uh, of course, required a certain uh, transition uh, and some getting used to. And there were some, you know, really interesting stories about how the villagers had to uh, get used to be get used and be familiarized with um, a new uh, mode of living and you know the, the the villagers were not the only ones who had to get used to high-rise living uh, the the Kongwaisil association uh, also had to build a new columbarium um, to house the very the the interred uh, remains of the the ancestors um, they hired an architect uh, taking soon who was you know, more well known for designing modernist structures such as the Golden Mile Complex as well as the People's Parks Complex, uh, which, uh, which means that he's quite an unconventional choice actually for um, the columbarium. And his design for the columbarium is rather modernist uh, with stark geometric lines, um, but he also managed to incorporate various elements of the Chinese vernacular architecture uh, within the design. So with the exhumation of the cemetery, um, Bishan was uh, in effect a tabula rasa, you know, a clean slate for the development of the new town. And for the Bishan new town, it can be considered as a second generation of HDB towns. Uh, whereas the first generation focused more on efficiency uh, as well as you know, getting housing the maximum, the most number of people in the shortest amount of time. Um, the second generation of town also looked at things like amenities, design, and comfort uh, to a much larger extent. Um, the, the design of Bishan New Town uh, is you know, separated into Bishan East and Bishan North. And of particular interest are the flats in Bishan North, which has uh, you know, varying heights uh, and a distinct red brick design that gives the area a very distinct identity uh, that is very much recognizable to be Bishan North. Bishan today has been developed and transformed into a vibrant and bustling new town of Singapore. However, memories of its past still remain in various forms. Firstly, physically, you can see that the tiled roofs in the various HDB blocks in Bishan North are meant to evoke memories of the various pavilions and the villages in the past. Next, although the cemetery hills in the past have been leveled, several parks, such as Bishan Amokyo Park, have been built to serve as a green oasis to provide residents with a respite from city life. Next, while the Kampong communities in Bishan in, in the past are no more, the area is still home to scores of new as well as former residents who have decided to stay put in the area. The new and former residents both grow up and build families here and different generations of residents now live in Bishan. Next, Another common scene from the past is that you can still find common spaces such as Junction 8 Shopping Centre, Void Dads, and other coffee shops which provide areas and gathering points for residents and members of the community to congregate, talk 
and interact each other, just like in the past where you had the Bishan coffee house. Next, I shall present to you some fun facts about Bishan, which you may have not known about in the past. Firstly, do you know that some trade women were involved in the construction of Bishan MRT station? This was one of the last projects of the Sun Woman women who contributed immensely in Singapore's development by serving as laborers in the past. Next, Red Brick Bishan. As you can see, the estates of Bishan are painted in colors that resemble the pavilions and old school red brick houses. The town council announced plans to repaint Bishan's flats in a medley of rainbow colors such as gray, red, blue, green, and all sorts of colors in the past. But residents decided to organize a petition to preserve the traditional colors in the past and it even ran out to the member of the parliament, Ms. Josephine Teo. They succeeded in the past and today, the original colors still stand on Bishan's flats to this day. Next, let's look at the MRT station. Now, we are all familiar with Bishan MRT station, but this was the MRT map in the past when the first two lines were just being built. The original name of Bishan was called Santeng MRT, as highlighted here. And it was only renamed Bishan MRT Station in 1994. Next, the original code of Bishan MRT was called N8 Bishan. This was because it was the eighth station after City Hall. You see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So in 2001, the MRT code was changed to NS17 as the government, the LTA, decided to standardize the MRT coding system for all new lines in Singapore. So I hope you have enjoyed your tour of Bishan today. So as a summary, let us look back at the historic maps of Bishan to trace the progress of Bishan from 1924 to today, which is what I presented. Let's look at 1924. Initially, Bishan did not exist on maps. It was just forested area, and people either referred to the area as Thompson, Tlapayo, or Amokyo. In 1945, which is the World War II period, you can see that a cemetery has just been formed and the various footpaths and cemetery have been built. As you go to 1959, the Big Santé and neighboring compounds show expansion. For example, this is the kampong and the northern part of the cemetery has just been built. Next, in 1975, when Singapore was undergoing immense development, electricity has arrived in Kampong Santé and the Kampong Santé Community Club was built to serve as a focal point and for residents together. In 1985, barriers uh, have been stopped it's in the past and the area was getting redeveloped. Bishan East has been redeveloped, as you can see, this is the current estate of Bishan East, while Bishan North was still being redeveloped. So, as you move on to today, today, this is the modern road network of Bishan, which you can compare in the past, it's such a vast difference. So we hope you enjoyed the tour of the historic maps of Bishan from 1924 to present.